Good afternoon. I think we will get started. We're only one speaker short, but we have a great lineup of speakers, so we can, we can worst case scenario, we can afford to, to, to have one less so, but hopefully uh, Paul will be joining us. Welcome to this workshop number 149 on crime and justice in cyberspace towards solutions. My name is Christian Borgreen. I'm with the Computer and Communications Industry Association, CCIA, and it's my great pleasure to be moderating this session this afternoon, uh, which is co-hosted by CCA and with the Council of Europe, with Alexandru, who is sitting here to my right, and who will be speaking later. Also, thank you to our online moderator, uh, Pierluigi Perry, uh, from the University of Milan. And Pierluigi, he will gather everybody's uh, online participants' uh, questions and comments. Uh, and you are very encouraged, both you here in the room, but also people who are participating online, to use this workshop's uh, Twitter handle. And this workshop is workshop149. So the Twitter handle is uh, hashtag WS149. Hashtag WS149. Very good. The evidence of crimes are increasingly only available in the form of electronic evidence, often stored in the cloud, which means often stored in a different country with a different set of laws. This raises complex questions and challenges for law enforcement, for governments, for companies, for users, and for others. At our workshop last year in, in Mexico, uh, we uh, spoke at length and, and identified uh, uh, some of the serious challenges related to this lack of a proper international framework. Uh, and some of the challenges that we identified were, one, a significant delay and difficulty for law enforcement to access data when it's stored cross-border. We heard from Council of Europe that less than 1% of cyber crimes reported ends up in court proceedings. And of course, this enormous frustration for law enforcement creates incentives for their governments to take unilateral actions, for instance, by blogging applications or demand that data is stored locally, so at least they can maybe easierly uh, get access to that data, or at least that's sort of the incentive that is created. Secondly, it also creates risk of uh, conflicts of national laws for companies, as illustrated in the case involving data stored by Microsoft in Ireland, so under EU uh, law, but requested by a U.S. prosecutor, so under U.S. law, which, con uh, which set of rules apply in these cross-border situations. Um, uh, fourthly, uh, also societal costs. Uh, Brookings estimate that government shutdown of applications uh, comes with a cost, a cost of, for society of more than $1 billion. And finally, some of the human rights uh, impacts, which hopefully Greg will be explaining a little bit more in details uh, in a moment. Fast forward from last year's workshop that focused on the problems and challenges. This workshop here will focus on the solutions, hence the thing in our, in our title. Um, and I'm delighted to have this uh, very, very good uh, lineup of speakers from industry, from governments, from civil society, uh, international organizations, and from uh, something in between, uh, a, 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 a uh, multi-stakeholder multi -stakeholder connecting factor, sort of, uh, of all these different <laughs> different folks. Uh, I would like to already now uh, jump to our first speaker. Oh, as you say, so we will have a uh, first brief introduction, uh, uh, remarks, about four minutes, five minutes maximum, else I have the hammer here. And, uh, and we will do that quickly. And then we'll open up for a very open uh, interactive session for people here in the audience uh, and people who will uh, participate uh, remotely. So very good. Our very first speaker is Priscilla Costa Schreiner from the Brazilian Federal Prosecutor. And uh, I have uh, said I might be a little bit provocative here, but my impression is that Brazil is taking a little bit more maybe forceful approach uh, to access electronic evidence. There have been some cases about blocking of uh, WhatsApp, mm -hmm. uh, which impacts 100 million users. So I'll be interested in sort of uh, better understanding. Clearly, I don't know nothing about what's going on in Brazil. So maybe you can just explain me a little bit better what is sort of the legal approach in Brazil and how do you try to improve this, uh, this challenge that you as a federal prosecutor I is faced with? Uh, of course. Uh, of course, Christian, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I, I can't start without saying how happy I am to be here to join all of you in this rich debate that I'm sure we will have. Uh, I will talk during my speech about uh, your concerns. And uh, of course, a after all, I'm available for, for any question, even after our panel here. 
Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to highlight two debates under development on the Brazilian Supreme Court regarding to WhatsApp complying with the Brazilian legislation. The case is so complex that our Supreme Court convened in June 2017 this year a public hearing to develop a rich and diverse debate in a multi-stakeholder environment in order to give our Supreme Court judges subsidies to deal with two actions, two constitutional action, actions that discuss the constitutionality of the Article 12, subparagraphs 3 and 4 of our Internet Civil Rights Framework, we call Marco Civil the Internet, that pred predict the possibility of temporary suspension and prohibition of users' data collection activities provisioned, provisioned on the Article 11 of this Marco Civil the Internet. And these were the main issues discussed in the public audience, but also there was a side debate involving cryptography. On this issue, I would like to send a clear message right now. The federal prosecutors in Brazil are not against cryptography. As prosecutors, we rely on end-to-end -end encryption to carry on our day-to-day -day job. And about the suspension penalties as provisioned in Marco Civil, civil right, our Internet Civil Rights Framework, I want to emphasize that the Brazilian Federal Prosecution Office understand that this extreme measure should be considered only as a last resource and with extreme caution. We should exhaust the economic penalties in order, in order to not affect the users of a service but it's just the company that are not complying with the Brazilian legislation and want to avoid themselves from uh, our jurisdiction and sovereignty. Nowadays, one of these constitutional actions, I'll put there in the slides for you, one of these constitutional actions, 5527, was sent to our General Prosecution Office for manifestation, and the other one, 403 is with the Supreme Court judge for appreciation about requests regarding to admission of a mixed courier. The other one I mentioned there in this slide, it's the declaratory action of constitutionally number 51 that was proposed just in December 50 before our Supreme Court by the ASESPRO. That's a, a, sigla, a sigla to Federation of Associations of Brazilian Information Technology, Technology Companies, with Facebook as a mixed courier. Ask that law enforcement requests for content data be, us be issued and conducted through mutual legal assistance treats, MLAT, rather than directly through Bra the Brazilian subsidiaries of tech companies. The author claims that in Brazilian investigations and criminal actions, the judicial decisions which aim to obtain private communications data under the control of ISPs with overseas headquarters must use the international cooperation procedures, even if such company has a branch in Brazil, because it considers that the, that the applicable jurisdiction in the case should be the one of the country where the company headquarters are located, instead of the one where they offer its service. The Brazilian Prosecution Service disagrees with this position. As it, for us, it contradicts the systematic and harmonic interpretation of the entire Brazilian legal system, ratified by our Internet Civil Rights Framework. According to the prevalence of the Brazilian law and jurisdiction, we have also our civil code, our civil procedure code, and our consumer code that follows the UN's document, 10 Rights and Principles in Internet Governance from 2011, which established guidelines in favor of consumer of these services, determining that such companies must comply with the laws of the location in which they provide their service. Concerning jurisdiction and Sorry, concerning jurisdiction and Brazilian law, it's very clear that any collection, storage, or processing of data of communications performed in Brazil by a service provider constituted under Brazilian law with an office established in Brazil, offer its service in Portuguese, paying tax, and make a advertise in Brazil must follow Brazilian legislation and obey judiciary orders. Of course, 
cooperation between countries is very welcome, but it just when it's really necessary and the country doesn't have another solution and their own law. In this issue, the MLAT would be needed for us just when an ISP, for instance, does not have a branch in Brazil or does not provide service targeted at Brazilian users. Naturally, international cooperation is thought to facilitate the obtaining of evidence and not to impose re restraints. To conclude, I would like to reinforce that the Brazilian Federal Prosecution Service is always making force to ensure agility for international cooperations. We also defend the adherence of Brazil to the Budapest Convention in order to stimulate the interaction between all of us and our countries. And this will be facilitated from our point of view with a common framework among countries so that the companies wouldn't have to comply with so many different legislations. At this time, I would like to compliment here Paul, the work of Paul and Bertrand and, this, and their team of internet and jurisdiction for their amazing work in whose discussions we actively participated through our colleagues Fernanda and Melissa. So, for us, the solution is cooperation, but not just outside, also inside each stage between all the multi-stakeholders. Thanks a lot for your time and thank you. Thank you very much. I think we're gonna, I, I like your, your, your final remark here, the solution is cooperation, because then I cannot really uh, 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 come back with you with any sort of uh, unilateral uh, uh, Brazilian approach here. I'm going to jump already to our next speaker here. I said in my opening remarks that, of course, for international companies, the lack of or this potential for conflicts of laws uh, can be a problem. And I mentioned briefly the, the, the Microsoft Island case. But I was wondering, uh, Paul Mitchell from Microsoft, can you give a sense of how, it, what are some of the challenges here? that companies are faced with, and where are you looking towards sort of international solution and cooperation that Priscilla uh, just mentioned, please? In, in four minutes, if possible. Sure, just give me a, a simple question. Um, first of all, I, you know, just give you a little bit of a recap, because I was here at this workshop last year, and, and last year I told you, any of you who are here, the story of our warrant case, which you just sort of mentioned, that which is against the U.S. government, in which our government in the United States seeks access to email data that's stored in a data center in Ireland. At that time, I noted that the case is not about the content of the emails in question. In reality, it's about the principles, the rule of law, balance of security and privacy, and the interplay of national and international law. I also told the story of how we were able to provide data to the French authorities dealing with Charlie Hebdo in uh, just 45 minutes, making the point that international cooperation, mm -hmm. international cooperation, uh, if those frameworks exist and they actually can work if they're applied properly. And finally, I recounted the story of the Brazilian police seeking data that was stored in the U.S., where providing that data would have been unlawful under U.S. law, which made the point that complying with one country's law for a provider like Microsoft may result in breaking another's, and then the challenge is, which one do you decide to break and why? So the Internet's exponential expansion is clearly creating pressure in all kinds of ways. And here at IGF this week, there are lots of sessions that explore the tremendous advances that are made in terms of economic, social, and other benefits that the Internet has brought to the planet. But it's also brought uncertainty and disruption and accelerated clashes of values around the world. And those values are important because they underpin the legal jurisdictions or the legal frameworks in jurisdictions around the world. And while we are all connected to this global ecosystem, it's right to acknowledge that there is no universal interpretation of applicable law and regulation dealing with jurisdiction of data at this point. Instruments such as NEMLATs can be helpful, but they are also cumbersome. More importantly, there is, as yet, an unresolved balancing act that must be managed between the rights of individuals, the rights of service providers like Microsoft, and the rights of governments. As one of the major platforms on the planet, uh, Microsoft does have an interest, as you mentioned, in getting these things right. We have over a billion customers, so that's a big responsibility. That's pretty much one-third of the connected population of the planet. Um, we have uh, operations in over 122 countries. We have over 100 data centers all over the world. And our mission is, is ambitious to enable every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. 
So it's clear to us that we need some kind of shared understanding of good governance on the internet backed up by appropriate laws that have due process and safeguards. For this global system, it's important to understand and to reconcile the objectives of different stakeholders across the spectrum. The growing digital transformation of the economy and everything else, the future of the Internet of Things and the potential innovations mm -hmm. around big data, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, and many of these things have just exploded since last year. Um, and all of these are you know, potentially in service of breakthroughs in things like climate science, healthcare, and renewable energy, renewable energy and all of these require the ability for data to be exchanged freely across borders and for communications networks to be able to exchange that information securely and predictably and in a way that is trustworthy. All countries want to realize these benefits and if anybody's going to realize the ambitious sustainable development goals, that's necessary. But to do so, all countries must ultimately cooperate to evolve the system of laws and norms to account for this increasing complexity. So here we are one year later, mm -hmm. and in many ways, things have not actually changed. While Microsoft won its case in the Court of Appeals, it's now heading to the U.S. Supreme Court, and I believe that the final deadline for um, briefs is January 11th, coming up. The issues at stake in the case have not changed, but there is now at least a greater understanding of those issues. One outcome of the Court of Appeals decision in the United States was movement in Congress to draft new, in, new legislation to update the law in the U.S. The International Communications Privacy Act, ICPA, was introduced by Senators Hatch, Coombs, and Heller, and an identical bill was entered in the House by Representatives Collins, Jeffries, Issa, and Del Beni. Among other things, this legislation is notable for its bipartisan support. The legislation would provide sensible ways for cross-border data access, a robust legal process to access the email of Americans and notification of foreign countries when required under international law. Potentially, it could be a model for similar legislation in other countries. Key point is that as a global technology company, we need clarity that this type of legislation would provide. We need clarity on how to make the calls between jurisdictions. We need clarity on how to enact process and and on what our rights and responsibilities are um, we need that clarity not just in the United States but in every jurisdiction in the world mm -hmm. and the in which we operate and that is the, the central struggle for a global provider like Microsoft with both distributed technical operations which are necessary to actually enable the the types of services we provide uh, as well as the fact that we have customers that are located not necessarily in the, in the jurisdiction where the technology supporting them actually mm -hmm, is. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, we have transactional, in, transactional environments in which um, customers on either end of that particular transaction also are subject to different jurisdictions. So it becomes a, a matrix case. And so far, we don't really have a good model for how to do that. Thank you very much for that perspective, Anna. So what I try to do here is to put people next to each other who are suing each other. So that's why we have, we have Microsoft here and, the, and Seth Bouvier from the U.S. Department of State, uh, who I don't think is the, the, the entity that is being uh, sued, but you know, still with the U.S. government. But Seth, uh, thanks for, for, for still showing up, even though we're, uh, despite be, me being a little bit naughty in, in, this, in the seating arrangement here. But uh, maybe you can provide just a quick introduction to the current frameworks and how the U.S. government is trying to improve existing frameworks or maybe even sure. develop new international frameworks. Sure, happy to do that and, and uh, be forewarned I have lawsuits against all of you ready to, ready to drop uh, <laughs> depending on how this panel goes. Um, so yeah, thanks for this, the setup, Christian. I think um, you know there's some, some background that you provided at the top that uh, we totally agree with um, in terms of the challenges for law enforcement and public safety officials um, you know, presented by this new environment and I think our assessment is quite similar to yours um, in terms of the implications, um, you know, would highlight in particular the conflict of law scenarios and the um, incentives that this creates for governments around the world towards things like blocking and data localization. And, um, you know, from our perspective as the diplomats in the State Department, um, you know, we, we do see a trend toward those things and, you know, I feel like there's, there's a balance here um, you know, we, we could be approaching a tipping point, and so 
I wanted to come here and tell you about some of the things that we're working on to try to improve the situation. And so um, we'll just try to go through them quickly so there's time for discussion. Um, but so the first thing is um, we're uh, trying to promote and advocate for solutions that currently exist. And so um, talking about things like the Budapest Convention, 24-7 network, I assume we'll hear about some of those things later on in the panel, but um, you know, a big part of our work is trying to promote awareness of those things and, and promote ascension to the convention. And um, actually, we're you know, getting some traction. There's new countries joining um, you know, every couple months. Um, so you know, I feel like we're making progress on that. Um, it's not a total solution, of course, but these are things that can make a difference, and they're available now. And so we're trying to sort of bring more countries into the fold there. Um, the second thing I wanted to focus on is um, efforts that we're making to improve MLATs. So, um, so mutual, assi mutual assistance, mutual legal assistance treaties are, um, if people are not aware, the sort of process through which countries request assistance between each other um, in attaining, attaining evidence. Um, and it's not just for electronic evidence, but it's for physical evidence and sort of long history of those things. Um, they're not the only mechanism, but they're the formal route for attaining evidence. Um, you know, they're, they're consistently a sore spot because they are slow, as you, as you mentioned. Um, but, uh, you know, I think we, there was a statistic I put in here, but um, in terms of our Department of Justice, in, uh, the requests that they received over the last 10 years increased by, um, you know, tenfold for electronic evidence. And so there's, you know, an element that th this is sort of not sustainable. And so we're putting sort of energy into trying to improve the process um, over the last few years trying to modernize the process, devoting additional resources, um, improving the tools used to respond to and track MLAT requests and streamlining the process itself. And, um, you know, in some cases, devoting particular individuals time to um, responding to requests from countries and working with those countries to try to improve the requests so that some of the delays are eliminated. Um, so, um, you know, we, what we want is we want the requests to get to the Justice Department lawyers very quickly so that they can act on them um, and, and eliminate some of the back and forth and the questions about the format, and et cetera. Um, so, uh, so, that's, so that's the other thing. We're trying to improve some of the existing processes that have caused some friction. And the third thing I know that, um, that we wanted to get to here is efforts that we're making to try to develop some more efficient approaches to cross-border access, sort of like the next generation um, in, this, in this space. And so um, I'm not sure if this was discussed at all last year, but um, we've – um, been considering for the last couple of years and in concert with people people here I think um, have been involved in it as well so it's no secret um, but we've been um, trying to address the need to access data overseas in a timely manner with appropriate privacy and legal protections and so we've come up with this idea of a framework under which US providers could disclose data directly to a foreign government um, for, for investigations of a particular sort um, for non US persons outside the United States um, under the legal framework of the, for the foreign country. Um, and so it would rely on the authorization in the foreign, in the foreign jurisdiction to access the data under its own legal system. Um, and we have, you know, in, you know, there's legislation in Congress that would be required, but it sort of sets out some of the standards here, which I I'm not sure it's worth getting into to that level of detail at this point. But, um, but we've been working on a framework, and it would be a bilateral framework with the UK. Um, and. Um, you know, this, this, we think that this approach could actually, um, you know, improve the process and, and allow for more timely and efficient exchange of data while at the same time being something that would be acceptable to um, the American public and legislatures and people concerned about privacies and civil liberties. Um, may hear, hear more about that <laughs> as we get to Greg. Um, but, I'll, but I'll stop for there. I'll stop there for now. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Maybe just one quick uh, follow-up question. So the MLAT procedure, the government uh, official uh, authorities to another government authority, that procedure is, is, is very lengthy. It can take many, many months. Right. Uh, everybody seems to say that, okay, it works, but it's way, way, way too slow. So it's not really working. And that's why you have this new uh, framework, potential framework between the United States government and, and the UK government where the UK government, uh, if there's a UK case, the UK authorities can get the data directly from the maybe a U.S. company, uh, rather than having to go through the the very cumbersome MLAT system, right? That's correct. Is that correct? Yeah. Understood. And how would then that potential framework between the U.S. and the U.K. How would that apply maybe to other uh, countries, to Germany or to 
future EU countries? <laughs> Hypothetically. Um, yeah, so we so I think the way that we're imagining this is, like I said, there's legislation that would be required to remove the, from the statute that prohibit the companies from sharing this information um, to start with. And as part of that legislation, it, it um, envisions bilateral agreements. And so we've talked to the UK on a preliminary basis, and um, I think we we view that as a, somewhat of a pilot. Um, and if it if it seems like the kind of approach that works for both sides and is able to sort of address all of the um, privacy, civil liberties protections that we hope that it will, um, you know, after some kind of evaluation period, I think we would look to potentially negotiate with other governments as well. In the in the legislation, um, if you if anyone's looked at it, um, they'll notice that there's a, a series of factors that are you know value that need to be evaluated under which the um, Department of Justice and the Department of State would certify that a country meets um, some substantive and you know, protected procedures. And so there's a, there's a process by which you, you know, make an initial judgment that the country's laws and practices are sufficiently robust to support something like this. Um, and then you can you know, potentially talk to them and, and form a, a bilateral agreement that could kind of fall under this, under this heading. So there's, I think, a way forward for, for, for expanding this beyond the UK if it proves to be, um, well, if it, if it comes to pass in, in legislation and proves to be something effective. Terrific. Great. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker, Greg uh, Nojaim from the Center for Democracy and Technology. I don't know if you have any legal court cases with the U.S. government or with <laughs> my organization. I hope, I hope uh, it would more, hopefully not with us. Um, or at least we will be maybe on the same side. Who knows? Uh, we, we talked a lot about the, the, the challenges for prosecutors, for companies who are sort of uh, in between uh, different regimes. Uh, and for, for, for the U.S. government, but we haven't talked much about sort of the human rights aspects here. What, how do we need to think in human rights in any international solutions we're discussing? Thanks. Thank you uh, for having me as well. Um, uh, thank you to the Council of Europe and to CCIA, and thank you all for turning out. Uh, my name is Greg Nojaim. I'm with the Center for Democracy and Technology. Um, we are a Washington, D.C. nonprofit civil society group. Um, we are um, dedicated to keeping the Internet open, innovative, and free. My piece of that puzzle is uh, government surveillance. Um, I want to say, to follow up on Seth's comments real quickly, um, we do need to strengthen the MLAT system. It could be made more efficient and still as rights protective as it is. I think a lot could be done on that score. Um, it is difficult, though, to see it adequately scaling to handle what would be the volume of requests if there was an efficient mechanism for um, turning over data to governments that need it. It's difficult to see that. And so we look to things like um, the possibility of bilateral agreements, and we ask ourselves, well, what needs to be in a bilateral agreement between two countries so that when data is sought by one country, one can be confident that the human rights of the person who is the data subject will be protected? And so we look at the legislation that um, the U.S. Department of Justice proposed and we see um, a number of shortcomings, um, and they are all remediable. Uh, one shortcoming is that it reserves to the Department of Justice and the Department of State complete discretion to decide which countries meet the standards set forth in the bill. That decision could be made based on um, uh, uh, findings of fact that are never made public. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, it it invites the possibility that politics, not an assessment of the human rights protections available, would be what makes the determination about whether a country gets one of these uh, agreements. We're concerned about the possible weakening of standards that normally pertain when a country today um, makes a demand for data held by a U.S. provider. Um, we're also concerned that the scope of the possible provider assistance that might be demanded by the country making the demand is left undefined. And the result of that could be uh, uh, infringements on uh, the ability of providers to offer end-to-end uh, -end encrypted services, because provider assistance might mean you can't do that because you can't get access to data. There's a risk of an end run around domestic law because there are broad shareback provisions in the proposed legislation, meaning the government that demands the data 
um, if it reveals information about a possible crime in the United States, could share that back to the U.S. government, and the U.S. government would get that information uh, without ever meeting U.S. standards. And the uh, proposal doesn't just remedy the slowness of MLATs, mm -hmm. it expands the kinds of data that would be available. Mm -hmm. Right now, you can't do an MLAT to get um, content in real time. There's no authority to do that, ever. Um, th these agreements would extend to real-time surveillance as well. So I think these are all remediable, and certainly we have, um, and we'll be working on language to address these problems. Um, what we also are working on are criteria for what, the, uh, what ought to be built into any new mechanism to deal with cross-border requests. What are the human rights criteria that there ought to be? And I'm going to list some right now. They're derived from the necessary and proportionate principles, which are principles adopted about four years ago by uh, about 400 civil society groups. And those, in turn, are derived from national laws and from uh, court decisions, um, in including uh, the necessary and proportionality inquiry under European law. Those concepts, and they must be built into any of these mechanisms that we're going to talk about today, are the concept of legality. That means that the uh, 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 authority to gain access to data has to be um, articulated in a statute that prohibits conduct, that gives the person whose conduct is being prohibited enough notice that their conduct is unlawful. There must be judicial authorization, uh, data demands authorized by a judicial entity, uh, a degree of probability, some probability both that there is a crime that's been committed and probability that the information sought will be evidence of that crime. Particularity, this is an element of the proportionality requirement in Europe, that the demand should be limited to seeking data relevant to the crime and preferably should specify the device account or person to whom the data pertains. There should be a loose, at least intrusive means test so that if the data are available without being as intrusive, the, the less intrusive means are used. A seriousness requirement, the crime, it can't be one of those stolen chicken cases. There was actually one of those, an MLAT for a stolen chicken case. Um, it has to be a serious crime, punishable by um, years of imprisonment. Uh, there should be a requirement of notice, notice to the data subject that their data was sought and turned over. That notice can be delayed if simultaneous notice would uh, infringe on investigation. There should be minimization requirements. Only information necessary to the investigation should be retained. Other information should be disposed of. Transparency requirements so that the country making the demands has to disclose how often it makes those demands, what proportion are granted. And finally, redress, a process through which a person whose rights are interfered with can obtain uh, a remedy. Incorporating these criteria into new mechanisms for uh, gaining data across, border, across borders, I think, would go a long way to making those mechanisms more acceptable to the public. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. I think we're going to go directly to Paul Fillinger, uh, who's co-founder and deputy director of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network, which I think I call the multi-stakeholder kind of um, uh, project here, but maybe you can briefly explain uh, the, the processes uh, the, that your organization is working on, and maybe also some of the policy options that you have identified, maybe even since uh, last year's session. Yes, absolutely, with, pre um, with pleasure. Um, so I think what, what is clear by the, um, by the interventions we had so far is that there's a lack of legal interoperability and legal uncertainty, and um, that the multi-stakeholder model can actually be a very um, promising avenue to develop the necessary operational solutions that we need. Many of you in this room probably know that um, last year in November, um, the first global internet and jurisdiction conference of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network took place in Paris that was organized in partnership with the governments of France. And um, the Internet and Jurisdiction um, Policy Network has three programs on data and jurisdiction, content and jurisdiction, and domains and jurisdiction, and obviously here I focus on the outcomes of the data and jurisdiction um, program. Um, so this conference gathered over 200 participants from over 40 countries, and um, the result was 
a common identification of so-called areas of cooperation. And based on those areas of cooperation that the different stakeholders identified, we as the Secretariat have set up um, this year um, contact groups. And um, the contact group on data and jurisdiction worked very intensively throughout this year. It comprised um, approximately um, 20 participants. Um, it's a pleasure to see that um, all entities that are here on the panel were actually actively involved in this as well. So um, there were representatives from the different stakeholder um, constituencies. And the result of their work, um, actually um, the Secretariat released uh, in November. Um, this is the so-called policy options document um, that you can also download from the website internetjurisdiction.net. And this policy option document and the work that was taking place this year between the stakeholders basically um, managed to identify building blocks for any regime um, that has to be found in view of the long-term development of the global cloud economy and in order to also reduce the incentives um, for mandatory data localization if no uh, solutions that are workable can be found. So those policy options are there to structure the global debate so that the different actors can synchronize, it identifies the different components that have to be discussed. Um, and um, basically what, what Catherine in one of the meetings that we organized in, in Paris called um, the manageable chunks. So the idea is to decompose this extremely complex debate that includes a lot of different factors into manageable chunks that can be discussed one by one. And um, these building blocks or manageable chunks are important for any potential regime um, for access of e-evidence in the cloud that is there to come. And of course, and I, this is, this is um, something very obvious for, for most people involved in those debates, how these issues are addressed will shape the future of the cross-border internet. And I think it's important to avoid any sort of unintended consequences by a lack of coordination between different processes that run in parallel because here on the, on the panel, all the major processes, and there are others as well, are, are, are there. There's the, the efforts in the European Union that, that Catherine will, will, um, will talk about after me. There's the Council of Europe. Um, there's the United States with the ECPA reform, the pending Microsoft case, the US-UK agreement, and many more. So the work in the data and jurisdiction program basically allowed to map the respective perspectives, to compare the different approaches the different processes are taking, with the goal to foster policy coherence. All actors, obviously, all stakeholders have different perspectives on those issues. And the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network, as a neutral um, place to discuss those issues, is a sort of connective tissue um, that allows the different processes to talk to each other and also to get feedback on prospective next steps. And, and um, this is important in order to identify possible steps for coordinated actions. For example, with regards to questions of what are the types of crimes um, in, in, um, in criminal investigations that should be covered? What procedures could be envisaged? And, and this is very important, what would be the future scalability of any avenue that is explored by the different actors? So those policy option documents lays out in detail um, the elements um, and the components to help structure those discussions. And I encourage everybody to have a look and also to discuss um, um, those policy options in their respective stakeholder groups and, and um, processes. This document um, will serve as the input um, for the second Global Internet and Jurisdiction Conference, which is going to take place at the end of February and um, will be organized in Ottawa in partnership with the Government of Canada. And can you already give us a little teaser what's going to come out in, in, in February in, in <laughs> Ottawa if you are looking into the crystal ball here? We're so excited. We, we want to hear a little bit. Uh, <laughs> give us a teaser. Season two. I think. Ottawa really matters. Ottawa will be a unique opportunity for the different actors because um, it is really a sort of critical mass of, 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 of actors that will gather there to discuss how to proceed together. And um, what we as the Secretariat hope um, will happen in, in, in Ottawa is that the different stakeholders can identify a clear roadmap forward. There's now a timeline and a perspective. You might have heard in, the, um, in one of the first main sessions of, of the IGF this year that the government of Germany is going to be the partner for the third Global Internet and Jurisdiction Conference in June 2019. So the time between Ottawa and Berlin matters and, and we believe as the Secretariat that we can really progress towards the development of operational solutions to hash out the different components. So Ottawa is the moment for the different actors to agree 
on focus and on the concrete next steps to structure the, um, the debate and um, to provide a path forwards because what is needed is operational solutions to get out of this current prisoner's dilemma situation. Of, of course, if we at the end of this session here already find all the solutions, uh, <laughs> they will, it's, it's bad for business for Paul, but, but, but the chances are that <laughs> Probably we'll have to <laughs> go to Ottawa uh, and, and enjoy some, some, some interesting uh, discussions there. All right, we're going to go uh, uh, straight next to the uh, European Commission, to Catherine bauer uh from the European Commission. Of course, there's no other political groupings of 28, 27 uh, EU member states uh, which are so well com connected economically, politically as the European Commission. So what is the European Commission doing? What are you doing maybe to streamline and improve the MLATs, which uh, we hear that could be a, a easy first steps? Uh, are there steps ta being taken to cooperate more with some of the companies, including Microsoft? Uh, and finally, what, what, is sort of how, what is sort of the answer you give to member states when they ask the European Com Commission to come up for solutions to uh, enforcement of uh, jurisdiction in cyberspace? All that, that was way too much in, in four minutes. All that, I'm setting my timer. <laughs> so, um, yes, thank you very much for having me. Um, I know I'm supposed to talk about solutions, but I want to take 30 seconds of my four minutes to talk about the problem, because um, I wasn't here last year, maybe some of you weren't either, uh, and there's a couple of figures I just want to get out there. Um, so I looked at my phone recently and tried to find an app that was based in Belgium or that stored data in Belgium, which is where I live. And I found two. I found my local transport app and I found my banking app. Everything else I have from somewhere else. So there's often very little connection between the services we use and the jurisdiction we live in. And in the European Union, we've done everything to facilitate this. We have a digital single market. We have opened our market to services from all over the world. Um, however, when you're viewing this from the law enforcement perspective, all of a sudden this wonderful borderless space uh, just has the borders going up again because as soon as the data is stored elsewhere or as soon as your provider is located elsewhere, you're stuck. And this is not a small problem. We surveyed European law enforcement uh, recently in the uh, big process that Christian was referring to and found out that in 80% of the cases that are currently investigated, digital evidence plays a role. And in 70% of those cases where digital evidence plays a role, uh, the evidence is located outside the investigating state. So this is not an insignificant problem. Um, and when you also look at the fact that we're doing everything to minimize data, in particular metadata, normally it will be gone within an average of about seven days. When you compare that to the 10 months that were referred to earlier as the normal response time for a mutual legal assistance request, it becomes uh, patently obvious that this is not the best uh, way forward. And uh, no matter what we do to fix mutual legal assistance, and we're doing a lot, it will never be able to keep up, for example, with a botnet that modifies its command and control server every three minutes. There's just no way that our processes uh, can match that speed. And uh, on top of that, there's actually not a lot of interest on the part of the governments who are on the receiving end of these cooperation requests to work on those cases because usually neither the user nor the case will have any link to their jurisdiction. It's just the jurisdiction that the data happens to be hosted in or that the provider happens to have its seat in depending on the connecting factor used. So that much for the problem, and I realize actually this is more than my 30 seconds. What are we doing? Um, the European member states have picked up on this problem and uh, asked us as the commission to do three things. They want us to fix mutual legal assistance. They want us to come up with better rules for direct cooperation across borders and they want us to um, propose options for the problem of jurisdiction more generally. So um, we ran an expert process for a year that uh, also was multi-stakeholder in nature. So actually um, all of the entities on the panel except for Brazil participated. Um, and uh, the basic um, concepts that we came up with were then presented to the European member states in June of this year in a package that comprised on the one side practical solutions to fix how we work with each other under the existing framework and on the other side um, options for legislative solutions for the member states to tell us uh, which ones they wanted to pursue. Now on the practical side, um, just a few highlights of what we're doing. Uh, within the EU, uh, we've established a platform for uh, to basically digitalize our judicial cooperation requests so that we can go from 
court in one member state to the court in another member state to quickly ask for data. Uh, it's still traditional judicial cooperation, so the deadlines are about 120 days, all steps comprised. It doesn't yet do everything to address the process, but we're trying to do what we can to speed up the process within these deadlines. We're also investing one million in training for the judiciary and law enforcement, specifically in cooperating with the U.S. I'm going to take an extra minute, if I may. <laughs> Um, to, uh, to make sure that uh, both in cooperating with the U.S. Department of Justice on mutual legal assistance and in the direct cooperation that is possible for non-content data with U.S. companies uh, that law enforcement and the judiciary know what they're doing and don't waste time on useless requests and make sure that they submit high quality requests. Um, we're also working on establishing single points of contact in all the member states for the relationship with the companies and with the DOJ uh, because that very much helps ensure the quality of the requests and also creates a relationship of trust that facilitates the cooperation. Um, and there's a couple more things we're doing. I would invite you to enter European Commission e-evidence into a search engine of your choice and you will see all of our measures that we're proposing on the practical side. But just briefly on the legislative, um, the member states asked us to put forward legislative proposals uh, on two aspects, namely on cross-border production orders, so on uh, possibilities for um, the judge in one member state to directly uh, compel a company based in another member state or offering services in the union um, to provide uh, data. And secondly, on um, the possibilities for direct access, um, which are situations where, for example, um, you're dealing with an illegal infrastructure, so there is no service provider whom you can uh, ask for assistance um, so, for example, um, a dark web forum um, where child sexual abuse images are being exchanged, that's a unfortunately frequent case we're, we're dealing with in practice. Um, there, um, the member states wanted an agreement among themselves uh, as to under which circumstances such forums can be accessed directly by law enforcement. And those are the two <laughs> solutions that we're currently working on. Uh, we will be presenting, hopefully, a legislative proposal to our College of Commissioners uh, next month. So by the time Ottawa rolls around, at least we will have a little piece to add to our solution. I'm happy to say that as of now, it responds to all of Greg's requirements. So um, that's a good thing. And um, just in terms of the connecting factor, I mean, one really important thing for us that emerged from the expert process was that uh, data, loca data location is not a connecting factor that we can work with unless we also want data localization requirements. And we definitely, for the union, have decided that that's not the way forward because it interferes with um, the freedom of establishment of the businesses who can choose to store their data wherever and it should stay that way. Um, and we're trying to do everything we can to line up with the very important work that has been done under the Budapest Convention already and that is now taking place under the protocol. So in terms of ensuring that our solution is not just compatible but takes cooperation for the EU member states a little bit deeper because we have that relationship of mutual trust among the 28 that we can build on. Um, and I think that's a good transition to our last speaker. It, it was impressive. I mean, this is, uh, you, you would be, you're the perfect panelist and moderator. You, you time, you time, uh, you have it. I mean, even better organized than a Dane, that's a German, right? <laughs> and uh, and you, you provide the bridge to, uh, to our final speaker, Alexandru uh, Prunza Nicolescu from the Council of Europe, which of course is more than 50 countries, which is also trying to, 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 to uh, pr uh, provide an international framework here. But maybe you can just briefly give an introduction to some of the solutions under discussion uh, at the Council of Europe under the framework of, the, uh, of cybercrime. Thank you, Christian. I will try to use my five minutes to uh, brief the people on what is currently the Council of Europe doing in order to improve criminal justice access to cross-border electronic evidence. And to put you a bit into the context, the Council of Europe, a European organization counting 47 member states, contributes to protecting societies worldwide against cybercrime throughout three complementary elements. The Budapest Convention on Cybercrime, an international framework on cybercrime and electronic evidence, the Cybercrime Convention Committee, TCY, representing the parties to the Budapest Convention, assessing the quality of implementation of the convention, and the capacity building programs on cybercrime delivered throughout a dedicated program office in Bucharest, Romania. The Budapest Convention is the most relevant international framework on cybercrime and electronic evidence. It currently counts 56 parties and 14 observer states 
and has numerous other countries who use the uh, Budapest Convention as guideline for domestic legislation. Now, the convention was drafted in early 2000 and entered into force in 2004. While it uses technology neutral uh, language in order to be adapted to current but also to future, future technologies, the fast paced developments of ICTs made that additional provisions are necessary as to provide solutions for criminal justice authorities to protect the rule of law in cyberspace. In the last years, the work of the TCY, the Cybercrime Convention, was very much focused on mapping the current and the future challenges to criminal justice in cyberspace and possible solutions to address these challenges. And based on the work of two working groups, the Transborder Group and the Cloud Evidence Group, and with inputs received from law enforcement, governments, private sector, uh, academia, civil society, uh, data protection organization, and European Union bodies, the TCY decided to start the process for an additional protocol to the Budapest Convention. And in June 2017, the terms of re reference for this additional protocol were adopted and the protocol drafting group was established in this sense. And according to the terms of reference for this additional protocol, this could include four types of provisions. The first, the first one, is represented by provisions for more effective mutual legal assistance. And this could include a simplified regime for MLA request for subscriber information, or a simplified regime for MLA request on emergency situations. Uh, international production orders, request in English language, etc. The second type of provision regards provision for direct cooperation between a criminal justice authority in one country and a service provider in a different country with regard to subscriber information preservation of data, or emergency requests. The, type, the third uh, type of uh, provisions regard a clearer framework and stronger safeguards for current, currently existing practices on transborder access to data. And the fourth type of provisions regard safeguards including data protection requirements. Now, a very important aspect discussed during the first P PDG meeting concerned the way ahead on coordination and cooperation with all involved or concerned stakeholders by this process. And the PDG decided in, his first in its first meeting to engage in close consultation with civil society, data protection organizations, and industry during the drafting process. Specific meetings will be organized for this purpose once draft concepts and texts are available. The Octopus Conference from 11 to 13 July 2018, so please save the date, will also be an opportunity for an exchange of views. In addition, having in mind the current develop, sorry, in addition having in mind the current developments within the European Union, the one that Catherine al uh, already mentioned about, and the fact that 26 countries are European Union member states and parties to the Budapest Convention, the protocol drafting group agreed to develop the process in close coordination with the European Union. The matters to be resolved within this additional protocol are complex, and it may be difficult to reach consensus on the options currently on the table. However, unless solutions are agreed upon, governments may be less and less able to protect individuals and their rights in cyberspace. So to conclude, I would invite everybody who can contribute to this process to be involved and engage in consultation with the TCY from early stages, and the first opportunity to do this will be the Octopus Conference from 11 to 13 July in Strasbourg, France. Thank you very much. Oh, I was good. Thank you very much. And now we heard from, from all our speakers here, we heard some of the, the concerns and challenges for, for uh, prosecutors in, in Brazil. We heard some of the challenges for companies who often are faced with conflicting uh, requirements, conflicting conflicts of laws. We heard from the U.S. government, which is working for Im improving some of the existing uh, measures, namely MNATS, but also thinking a bit new, how we can we make new processes, namely the uh, U.S.-U.K. Uh, sort of uh, more direct uh, framework for, 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 for access to, to evidence. We heard some of the uh, human rights uh, requirements that needs to be built into these international frameworks and maybe even improve some of the existing ones as well. We heard from our um, uh, multi-stakeholder project here, uh, how if you bring together different stakeholders, you can actually come up with different solutions which will be revealed at the latest in February in Ottawa. We heard the European Commission, which already next month will be you're competing a little bit here with the with the, <laughs> with the internet guys, but uh, jurisdiction guys, <laughs> and already uh, next month uh, we'll have a, a legal uh, proposal, a legal framework uh, being presented. 
uh, for discussion. And I believe you have already discussed this uh, with different stakeholders from uh, companies and, and governments, etc. And then finally, we heard an even broader uh, plus 50 uh, country Council of Europe framework uh, that also will be uh, presenting uh, progress. I, I didn't understand actually what was the time frame for, for this uh, additional protocol to the Cybercrime Convention? Thank you, Christian. So according to the terms of reference for this additional protocol, if everything goes well, uh, the draft should be ready late 2019 and uh, uh, decided uh, on it uh, during the TCY plenary in December 2019. Okay, so maybe ready for IGF uh, in, in a year's time or so. Okay, very good. This is the, it's gonna get even more exciting because hopefully uh, you have plenty of questions and maybe we even have some questions uh, from some of the remote participants but I would uh, welcome any questions here from the floor. Can I ask if a question? Are, yes, please. And then we're going to use her afterwards. I, I have a question for Alexandra. Um, so the, the, um, the work plan says that there'll be a consultation in July of 2018, uh, but it also says that an inventory of provisions for the uh, protocol has al should already have been developed, reviewed, and adopted. Uh, there would be five meetings of the protocol drafting group and the protocol drafting plenary prior to the consultation. Um, you will have already conducted the first and second readings of proposed of the proposed provisions of the protocol prior to that July consultation. When can we expect to see a draft? Thank you, Greg. So basically the first protocol drafting meeting was a brainstorming exercise when different type of provisions to be discussed were discussed. And um, the group divided in breakout groups and dis are uh, discussing on different type of provisions but only on the level of concepts. So the first moment to ask uh, feedback from uh, all stakeholders will be when something palpable will be there, some, some concepts, some draft text in order to be able to, to receive feedback. I, I guess my point is there'll be a second reading prior to the July meeting. Uh, that's, what, no, no. that's what it says in the work plan. No, I'm afraid um, this is not true. Um, there, uh, there won't be any reading, any text or until uh, July that, uh, that will be discussed. There will be uh, different type of provisions discussed within the breakout groups and uh, they will be presented for the plenary meeting in July, the meeting that will precede the uh, Octopus Conference and they will be presented for discussion during Octopus following the first TCY and first plet because there are two types of uh, groups. There is a protocol drafting group, the one that is drafting the, the, the protocol and the protocol drafting plenary, the one that um, decide on the further steps with the protocol. And uh, it, 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 it is comprised by all the TCY parties and observer states. I hope that provided some clarity else. I think you will probably be discussing afterwards, but I, there was a question here and if there's any other questions, we go to you afterwards. Yes, sir. Uh, hello, my name is Frank Pace. I'm with the Security Technology and Privacy Research Group out of the Netherlands and former US law enforcement. And um, I have a couple of comments towards, uh, for Greg and also a uh, question. Uh, one, um, I, I would agree with your one comment about the MLAT uh, process, of course, as it currently is, and maybe what it will become, maybe never scaling to the current needs. And as a former Cyber Task Force officer, I, I could completely see that how that has been the case and, and, and will continue to be so with the, with the rise in the request for digital evidence. Um, that, that being said, going back to the comments regarding some of the concerns you had, especially related to human rights, um, one of which was the comment about uh, the sharing back of uh, the share back of uh, data. I, I think again, I would agree that that's easily uh, 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 there's a solution to that in the sense that if we could ensure that it meets the probable cost standards of, of U.S. law enforcement and how if they were to receive that data, then of course they could act on it. I think that's currently the situation that you see, and when we do have our colleagues. Um, um, from abroad that do share that information. If we're meeting those same standards and if that was articulated and uh, verifiable, then I would think we could agree that uh, we could find a solution to that concern. And the other would be um, some of the concerns about notice uh, for those that are, are having their data. 
uh, reviewed or seized. Um, one of the topics I, I typically encounter when we, we talk about human rights issues is that um, we need to, I think, believe to focus on the human rights of the victims that are, that are uh, involved in these crimes. And we look at cases of child ex exploitation, human trafficking. Uh, these are all cases where there's immediacy of need and the uh, ability to address these crimes as soon as possible. And I think there, there should be focus on, on that as well and the victims and the rights of those victims. The question I guess I would have is that when the comment was made about if a solution would be um, uh, bilateral agreements and if there was discretion at the DOJ level within the U.S. and a concern for how that discretion would be used, I think the uh, analogy I would use or, or how we could look at this is the, the current um, processes that we use with Interpol now on red notices. Um, the notices that come in from any country of any member state from Interpol is reviewed by the Office of Legal Affairs and there's a level of discretion that is made on whether or not that notice will be issued if it's in, uh, not only in compliance with that nation's laws but if it's also meeting human rights standards as well. Um, I want to get your thoughts on that and maybe any other member of the panel if that has been considered as one of the uh, solutions in addition to what was already mentioned um, as far as how we could look at whether through international data access warrants or a, uh, a panel, if you would, uh, to address these concerns and that they would meet those of both parties involved. Thank you. So uh, notice, discretion, and the share back. Um, on the share back, um, if there was probable cause um, found by a judge that the information um, uh, met the probable cause standard, we'd have no problem with it. Um, that requirement is not in this legislation. Um, thank you for your support for adding that. Um, on notice, notice to the target of the surveillance can be delayed in order to protect the integrity of, of the investigation. On the discretion point, the point that I was making was that DOJ and state have complete discretion to decide with which countries the United States will enter into these agreements. Um, ideally, there would be some supranational decision maker that would say, these countries can enter into these agreements because they both have strong human rights standards. There isn't such a decision maker. The, the best thing that we've come up with to deal with that problem is more transparency. Require the government, the Department of Justice, to publish a report about why it thinks this country's um, processes meet the uh, uh, human rights standards articulated in the legislation. And then um, make that public, give people a chance to comment on it, and then um, the Department of Justice and State will make their decision after receiving um, this commentary. Great. Yeah, the only follow-up question I would have would, it, would then be for the gentleman from State would be, you know, would that be an issue, of course, having to create more reports on the potential violations of human rights for other countries? Uh, yeah, we love writing reports, so uh, that's always <laughs> welcome. Um, I, I just want to sort of set the stage for people just on this because it's sort of getting into the sort of intricacies of U.S. domestic policy and just so people understand where things are at the moment. Um, there's a draft uh, piece of legislation that's with our Congress. So um, nothing's enacted. There's no final decisions. We have a public process. We have a, a process of public debate um, that will um, – well, things have sped up in, in our legislative uh, process recently, so, I guess, so I'm not going to make any predictions. But um, you know, th this is where we are right now. There's there's a piece of legislation. It's on the web. You can anyone can go look at it. It's not it's not um, hard to find. Um, and the questions that have been raised by Greg and by others are about specific elements that are in there. Um, I will I will say that there was substantial discussion within the USG about each of these each of these topics and. What we decided to do was to put out the legislation, um, you know, we, to hand it over to Congress and, and see what they would do with it, right? The question is whether um, the American people and sort of this community and, and, the, and the Congress themselves are comfortable with where we've set sort of the balance points on all of these issues, right? And so, um, you know, the issue with the, with the round tripping or the, or the pass back, um, you know, where do you, how do you deal with that, right? Because um, obviously there's the issues that Greg raised on the other hand, um, you know, if there's if there, if there's a foreign government that has information about an, an imminent attack, um, you know, at the same time we do want to know about that. So, so what are the parameters, and how do we deal with that, and where's the right place to put the to put the sort of balance point? I think these are all legitimate questions. I think um, a lot of what Greg raised is addressed in there in some way or another, and it's this question of sort of getting the right balance, and, and is it something that 
everyone is comfortable with. So, um, so that's where we are in terms of the specific question. Um, Frank, I think, um, uh, you know, I think that the details of how we do the evaluation are still um, to be determined. Um, you know, we don't know if this is going to become law, or, and if it does, what the requirements will be, and what it will look like, and what the process will be. So I think it would be sort of early days to speculate. I think we're expecting it to be a pretty, a pretty substantial requirement on us to make that determination. Um, and so a, a lot of what we're hoping to get out of this is flexibility, um, because you know we want this to be something that actually could happen and could work. Um, and that you know if it requires advice and consent of the Senate. Um, to like a like a treaty, then that's going to really hold things up. If it's going to require these extensive documentation and reporting, we'll do it. Um, but you know, we do like some flexibility. So, you know, I, I don't think anything's on, on or off the table. You know, decisively. Maybe a quick question here to uh, to to the European Commission: Would this, if there would were ever a, a bilateral uh, framework between the U.S. and the U.K., would that be something that the uh, the EU as a whole would be interested in having a bilateral EU-U.S. kind of framework? And what would be sort of the, the safeguard mechanisms that would have to be in there? Thank you, Christian. Maybe if I may just briefly come back on this question of the share back, because this is also something we looked at, uh, and we identified two angles. I mean, first of all, um, as the colleague from State was saying, there are situations where you would want to have information about intelligence, um, especially when it's a situation of imminent attack, so the prevention side of things. There, we didn't see such an issue if information that France obtained from a German provider that was pointing to an imminent attack on German territory was shared back with the German authorities. But then uh, the second question is the use of that evidence in court. And actually here, the situation is quite different because as law enforcement, you have to prove that the information or the evidence that you gathered was gathered in accordance with your national standard. And if that was not the case, then you cannot use it in court and that very much limits the impact of the or the risk of share back for the purposes of use in court. Because if we have a country with a lower standard, and I think that's the implication here, sharing back with a country with a higher standard, then that evidence will simply not be useful in court and the check is already built into the system. Um, on the, um, and also on this aspect of, of um, what we're expecting from mutual legal assistance. I mean, I think we need to be very clear because you raised this very important point on the human rights. Um, the mutual legal assistance process was not built in as such to protect the human rights of the user. It was built to protect the sovereignty of another state from uh, enforcement activity of, of the investigating state. Um, and so when you look at the protection of the human rights of the user, that's actually going to be in many cases very hard to do for the uh, requested state because very frequently that user has absolutely no connection with that requested state. You're often looking at a situation where there's a German authority investigating a German case with a German suspect who happened to use Yahoo email. Um, the US government has absolutely no information about possible legal privilege or immunities of that German citizen because that's not something that they have access to. And so I think that's also where we need to manage our expectations as to what mutual legal assistance can do. Now, as to this agreement, of course, I mean, the US, uh, the US-UK agreement is something we're also looking at from the perspective of the EU as a whole. Um, and we think that in terms of the harmonization that has already been done, both on the judicial procedural side in terms of implementing safeguards all across the union that are harmonized, and also from a more general fundamental rights perspective, that the union would easily meet the criteria that have been set out and is of course interested in having an agreement um, that would also uh, maintain the, the strong levels of safeguards that are already in place on both sides and find ways in which the differences can be made compatible among one another. I'm just gonna remind everybody that at the very end you will get basically in, in 15 <laughs> minutes, you will each get one minute to summarize your points. So if you feel you have not been heard, you will get one minute. And, and then both uh, Catherine will take her clock and I'll use my <laughs> hammer uh, to sanction that one, that was 60 seconds. But we have a question here in front. Uh, thank you, I'm Sonia from Third World Network and I'm sorry I missed this session last year. So I was shocked to hear about the extent of the problem from the EU that 
the proportion of investigations that need digital evidence stored in another country and that's on average 10 months for an MLAT. So I wondered if there are um, countries where law enforcement does require a copy of this data to be stored locally. I heard there were some in the EU, I don't know if it's German telcos or something. And is there a mapping of this? You know, how many law enforcement jurisdictions today are requiring a copy of what kind of data stored locally for these reasons? And I just had a question to the Microsoft uh, person as well. You said that in, you had 45 minutes you could give the data for the Charlie Hebdo case. So what framework was that under? Is that some alternative to all these MLATs? Uh, or is it something Greg would be worried about? Uh, how is that a miraculous one that worked compared to the normal 10 months? Thanks. Thank you very much. Maybe we'll go to Catherine first. But of course, of course, nobody wants, if you believe it, one free open internet to have data to be stored, forced to be stored locally. But is there a measure, and yet you understand that the law enforcement want to have quick access to that data. Yeah. Um, is there a mapping of, of uh, countries that require law enforcement data to be stored locally? Um, we don't have one at the EU level. I mean, I'm aware of a number of third countries that have it systematically in place. In terms of EU member states, um, what you say is correct um, when it comes to metadata that is stored for the purposes of complying with the German data retention obligation which in fact is not enforced right now because it's been suspended by the German authority uh, pending uh, or judicial review. But if, uh, when, if that legislation is active, then um, metadata that is stored because of this retention obligation has to be stored in Germany. So we have a couple very limited cases within uh, the EU where that we're aware of. There's no systematic mapping, but the large majority of, uh, of countries have no such data storage obligations. Thank you very much. Uh, Paul, uh, which legal framework was used when, uh, when we had those terrible attacks, uh, Charlie Hebdo attacks in Paris? So uh, my understanding of the way it worked, uh, and just to be clear, it's our response time was 45 minutes but from the time we got the request. So the request went, what happened is the French authorities determined that the suspects had Microsoft mail accounts. Uh, the French authorities contacted the FBI, the FBI contacted us. We provided the data to the FBI after validating that the request was legal and the FBI provided to the French authorities. But our turnaround time was 45 minutes. The total time was somewhat less than several hours because it was still an ongoing thing. The, the operative statute in the US has an emergency exception that yeah. permitted Microsoft to make that disclosure on an emergency basis without going through the MLAT system. I think there was uh, another question. Maybe we'll take two this time. Yeah, please. Hi, I'm Eleanor Buxton from the UK government. Um, just to reinforce uh, the priority that we place on this, as Greg knows well, having dealt with my colleagues in the Washington Embassy time after time, um, you know, and I've been recommending reading to people all day. Um, our Deputy National Security Advisor actually testified in Congress, which is pretty much the first time we've ever let a sitting official do that um, because of the importance that we place on this agreement. And you can read his testimony, which is public, on why we think this is such a pressing issue. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, there's lots of conversations about do other people want their agreements. We know lots of other countries are interested in having similar arrangements. We haven't signed ours yet. As Seth said, it's all still in the works. Uh, and it requires the US to change their legislation, but we think that this is a model that other countries could profit from. Uh, at the moment, the flow of requests is to the US, which is why that's where our focal point is. That may well change in the future. There are other countries who are definitely gonna be interested in this. It's just how do you get your procedural frameworks to the right level where you can both profit from such an arrangement? And that's, I think, the really key question in terms of you know, how do you extend these things is, like Greg said, what should be the minimum criteria that you're looking at? Um, and, and what we see is, you know, if countries want this, this is an opportunity to improve due process. Um, you know, we want to minimize data localization worldwide and we want to up standards and actually looking to, to sign sort of similar agreements elsewhere would actually be a really, really good opportunity to do that. We're just fortunate to have a very close relationship with the US and relatively similar systems, but I would just stress, you know, we don't have the same system and so we may not meet the exact same standards as the US in, t in how they are worded. And I think that's been a point of contention I know with US civil society. But the fact is we do have different laws that are agreed through different processes. We have a parliamentary system. And you know, to a certain extent, you have to respect those differences and try and figure out how you, um, how you sort of deliver that objective standard versus meet you know, a particular standard which has been instituted by another government. Great, thank you for that clarification. I think there was a question over here. Yes. Hello, my name is Bruna. Uh, I have a question for the Brazilian representative. Um, she men you mentioned the civil rights framework 
for the internet in Brazil, Marco Civil. And so it's a legal tax, a law for entraining grant, uh, guarantees, principles, rights, and duties on the usage of internet in Brazil. But um, the Marco Civil Internet she also mandates companies to often keep the data in case of any legal prosecution means. And also, and I mean, but sometimes I, I, I actually like in the actual situation of Brazil, the car wash operation, I tend to see some sort of, um, I have the feeling that sometimes the legal authorities, they do, they, they, they are like promoting some sort of overreaching or power of abuse on like such requests for information because I mean the number of the amount of information is far too like it's far more than you should you should consider like usable and I would like to know like what, what are your thoughts on that uh, Bruna thanks a lot and you're right on the article 3 of uh, uh, Marco Civil the internet as we know it we have principles and of course all of us uh, need and want to respect it. Uh, you are right in a comment of yours. Unfortunately, some judges, we have the federal uh, prosecutors and we have state prosecutors, federal judges, state judges. Sometimes it's, uh, we don't need content to persecute a crime. The metadata is enough and uh, sometimes uh, we, we just with the metadata, the judge don't need to respond with, we can, I think in Brazil call iron hand. You mentioned car wash. It's because of this, we had a, a decision of a, a Judge Moro in this, app applying a, a multa, a tax, because of uh, a company didn't give some uh, um, a data to uh, continue the investigation. So what I can tell you, us from the Federal Prosecution uh, Office in Brazil, we are doing speech, we are doing workshops, with, uh, we try to reach as more as possible of law enforcement people, of judge people, that to use this resource that the law gives, the same civil framework, internet civil framework, as a last resource. Like I said, sometimes just the, the simple information can perse persecute the crime. And otherwise, when you need more, you don't need to request for a penalty that uh, don't reach just the company and reach also the consumers. This we don't want. No one of us like it. Sometimes it's needed. And I just want, I really, I, I want, I was, I'm going to finish. The problem uh, is not uh, to disrespect, uh, it, the problem is disrespect of law. And disrespect of law can have answers. And we have other answers that are more effective and respect human rights also. Thank you so much for, for that response. I'm sure you will be talking a bit more afterwards maybe. I think there was maybe one or two final, final questions Or not? Didn't I see a hand over here? Any questions, comments? Okay, well, one there, and then the final one from the gentleman here. Yes, sir. Patrick Curry, BBFA. Um, this comment came up in the legal group first thing this morning, uh, so I'll kind of make it again. There have been huge uh, progress in the sharing of cyber threat intelligence, vulnerability data, both in industry and in government organizations. And in the EU alone, in the last seven years, we've seen a rise from two to over 220 computer emergency response teams and similar organizations. The amount of collaboration that's occurring is documented inside the EU, uh, in DG Connect, um, in, in many areas. And I'm just wondering whether all of the discussion today could leverage the great degree of collaboration which is already occurring elsewhere and I would also wish to invite any members of the panel if they wish to contact me, because some of us know each other, um, because we have a legal working group that's um, operating in London, and they would be very interested to have suggestions as to, as to how uh, some of this leading practice cross-fertilization could be taken forward. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Patrick, for that question. Um, it, it, that we, we have really made some major steps forward on cybersecurity intelligence sharing. Um, one challenge that we still face, at least within the union, 
is to put law enforcement in the loop. Uh, member states are quite hesitant uh, to have threat intelligence necessarily shared also with law enforcement. And one simple reason is that law enforcement um, is, uh, is bound by very rigid processes. Um, in many countries, they have to launch an investigation, they have to undertake investigative steps, and um, that may throw a wrench into the plans to actually deal with the cybersecurity threats. And that creates issues for both the companies that are sharing the intelligence and sometimes even for the cybersecurity authorities. Um, that being said, of course, we hope that this situation can evolve. Um, but the, other, the other challenge is that, of course, um, to have evidence that uh, we can use in court for law enforcement, it needs to be obtained in a specific manner. And the way that threat intelligence is shared does not always meet that standard. So those are the two basic challenges that we're struggling with at the moment in this context. But indeed, it's something that we're very actively exploring, and Europol has really taken some major steps in terms of getting European law enforcement involved with very co close co collaboration with ENISA, um, the, the European um, Cybersecurity Agency that is just being expanded. Uh, and we're hoping to indeed build on this more in the future. Thank you so much. I think one final quick question. Not, not so quick, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> Uh, Ian Brown, purely in a personal capacity. I'm, I'm interested, um, the commission, commission representative's response to um, sadly slightly getting in the way of the, the happy narrative that's sort of been developing in the discussion so far, um, the, the sort of mauling of various EU legal instruments that the Court of Justice has delivered over the, over the last several years in cases like Watson, Schrems, and Digital Rights Island in particular. Um, whether you think institutionally the Commission has fixed the problems with the internal human rights advice that clearly was coming um, and that the, the mechanisms that you're now developing would be robust against similar legal challenges in future. Right, an easy one to end the session. No, um, I think and that also brings us back to the, um, to the point that Greg raised earlier about surveillance. I mean, to be very clear, what we're talking about here is nothing related to bulk data retention. We're talking about. Much more broadly, I'm not only talking about data retention, about the compatibility of directives that have gone right through the EU legislative process then to be found to be so problematic in accord with the Charter. Right, so um, the, the court has pronounced itself on on data retention specifically and the collection of uh, volumes of data that taken together can reveal important information, for example, about the, the location of a person over a given period of time. So that might allow, uh, if access is granted to law enforcement, that might allow law enforcement to identify where a person lives, where a person works, <coughs> how that person gets from the place where they live to the place where they work. Uh, so indeed, uh, information that in aggregate is quite sensitive in terms of the information it can reveal. What we're dealing with here is uh, neither an obligation to retain any such data, nor an obligation to divulge large volumes of data. We are talking about production orders. You'll be um, able to talk more <laughs> in, in five minutes, and then you can uh, ask. Yeah. But um, in terms of, I mean, it's very, it's very hard without going into the details of the instrument to talk about how it meets human rights standards, which uh, we believe it does, otherwise we wouldn't be proposing it, and we also do read the jurisprudence of our own court. But um, in, in that being said, I think what we're dealing with here is a different kind of impact on fundamental rights than the kind of impact that the Watson and Digital Rights Ireland judgments are dealing with. Thank you very much. And of course, uh, anything legally that the EU does has to meet this very, very high bars of the, you know, fundamental rights uh, in the EU and uh, has to be, you know, hold up in court. Well, I'm perfectly Bef comfortable that it will. But that it has to be seen in court by the, by the court itself. Very good. Before we go to the final summarizing points from each of our panelists, I just want to say a big thank you to our rapporteur, Andrea uh, Kandrian, from the Swiss Federal uh, Office of Justice, uh, who will be uh, trying to summarize all the questions and the points being made and that will be made available online uh, as, as well with all the presentations and links to further information, uh, including from, from Brazil. So with no further ado, one, question, uh, one minute each to summarize your point, please.
myself. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to say we are here repre representing, like you said, Christian multi-stakeholders. And if you look at the word multi-stakeholders, -stake we are not here far away of being enemies. We are here together. We are, we are holding hands here against one enemy, the bad users of internet. And these bad users provocate crimes, and sometimes very critical crimes involve, like uh, someone said, child abu abuse, terrorism, and et cetera. So uh, we must, yes, cooperate internationally, but uh, we must, and we are doing it in the federal prosecution of cooperate inside our country with uh, uh, some ISPs, with uh, other law enforcement, and with civil society, and with NGOs. And I would like to say, uh, as uh, Paul said, we are in the second and third year here, and I'm glad we are still here discussing it and bringing again this issue and developing so we can step by step go further. I believe that. Thank you a lot. So I think the, uh, the real summary is we need to, to keep working on this process. We need to keep working on it together. We need to learn more and more about what the, where the definition of boundaries are of between the subjects and, and so that we can actually craft better rules for jurisdiction from a tech community's perspective, or at least from, from Microsoft's perspective as a global cloud service provider. This is a global problem. A patchwork of national legislation is all we're likely to get in the mm -hmm. near future, but it would be really nice if that legislation was harmonized as as, as nicely as possible, especially the idea that um, any individual country wishes to assert jurisdiction over uh, extraterritorially in other jurisdictions to the, to the extent that we create global chaos in jurisdictional uh, matters, which is basically what the Warren case is about, that's a problem. Um, uh, other than that, we really want to make sure that we have clear and concise rules to follow. because uh, countries will not tolerate it and they shouldn't tolerate it. It, it can't be the case that um, people commit crimes and they uh, are not prosecuted because the evidence isn't available for technical reasons. I don't think that's gonna survive uh, much longer. So when we look at solutions, um, I, I hope that we uh, incorporate the human rights protections that I outlined uh, earlier, uh, around which I think there is a growing consensus and uh, I know they don't have to be U.S. standards. They can be uh, um, articulated, I think, in a way that uh, would be acceptable um, to many countries. I will add one more thing. When it comes to coming up with um, new mechanisms for dealing with this problem, the entities that are working on creating those must have transparent processes. Transparency builds trust, and a lack of transparency will build suspicion distrust and resistance. And so I would just urge that as um, people are working on things, even the US-UK agreement, which is drafted but not public, um, those things ought to be made public so that uh, there can be commentary and improvement um, from uh, other stakeholders. Thank you very much. Um, I think, um, well, it is clear that those are urgent challenges. Um, I would say they're among the most complex um, challenges that we're facing in sort of the global governance um, um, landscape um, of how to solve them. And I think the different actors um, um, have to ask themselves, what is the alternative? Um, can we afford not to solve those questions? And I believe we cannot. 
how we will solve those questions will have fundamental um, um, impacts on the future of the ecology of the internet, of the cloud economy, of well, the organization of digital societies and how national and global and open the internet will be in the future um, for the future generations. So I think it's high time. I think what needs to be achieved is um, a structure of the global discussions, a very clear overview of the different ongoing processes, where they are, what they propose, how they interface, how they can interact. There's um, a big need for sustained coordination between the different actors. There's a big need for cooperation among governments, among all stakeholders, among all the different processes. And there's a need for solutions that can scale because um, internet penetration is increasing around the world and we need scalable solutions. And um, so um, I also take this opportunity to shamelessly say if you're interested in, in the second Global Internet and Jurisdiction Conference, there's a session about this tomorrow at 9 in room 9. Yes, thanks to the organizer and th organizers and thanks to you all for attending. I have little to add but just to say that um, I think the challenge we all face is to basically determine now uh, what else can be done to fix uh, the existing processes and make sure that we work as well as we can in the framework of those processes and then for those cases where we decide that the current processes don't fit to come up with legally sound and internationally compatible solutions that address uh, the challenges that we face today. Thank you. I will conclude. I think we are all, agree we are all uh, agreeing that uh, urgent solutions are needed to be taken in order to provide criminal justice authorities with um, instruments to protect the rule of law in cyberspace. I think we are also agreeing on the fact that uh, individual rights should be protected, being individual rights of victims or individual rights of suspects within this framework. And I think that uh, developing such a framework under the umbrella of the Council of Europe, uh, an organization who stands for human rights, rule of law and democracy, could uh, give sufficient warranty of the fact that this interest will be balanced and feasible solutions to embed all interest will be found. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Please join me in a give a round of applause for our panelists here. Thank you for your presentation.